stadium is here. Like that one has uh, 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 an Abidjan uh, uh, stadium. You give it there. You are making progress under a federal constitution. That was the question of getting an education. This is the problem the South has gotten now under the regime and before. And that has been solved since 1954, before independence. What is called self control now is derivation. And we have seen them on teaching and then derivation. By that time, the northern region had 50% because of their grandmother. The western region had 50% because of their couple. The eastern region had 50% because of their family. And we are moving on. I was not able to do the federal education, to do the free education, because of the summer, who is now the education of police and everything, which we are now educating for. That is the work of the government program. We have to and transport in the in the society. And those of us who are anxious about the country, the many one, and society that they let us go back to the government. Unfortunately, our police who are in the even some of our own members who came into office to the clamor for frugality, to the clamor for inflation, now deny.
Il lui dit, Dieu que nous faisons d'admettre, je vais dans le livre Philippe, il dégomme son corps, il y a une bonne vie. Et quand il fait, c'est le.
Put it what you want there. And move on for unity in peace. Thank so you so much. that you continue to rule on under this constitution, you are wasting time. Yeah, thank you so much. And now I am too old to be talking about that constitution. For an to general society like ours. And then I told that you, the constitution we are having now is a federal constitution. Okay. It's not our constitution. Because we're asking why is it now? It's not our constitution. It's not the constitution we have that are the independent. And most, most, so, most importantly, it has failed. Everybody testified to that. It is not working. You are already It is not that you are already in a failed state. To save us from this failure, you, the friends of President Buhari, to change the constitution now to a constitution that everybody will agree to, not a constitution where we discriminate against the people of the country, not the people. Thank you so much, Chifayo Adebanjo, um, for that very passionate contribution to the conversation. Um, we are running out of time, so you have to forgive me if I'm rushing through this. I'd like to quickly call Professor Asai Ujula to deliver his own paper. Thank you. Your Excellency, President uh, Goodluck Ebele Jonathan, former president and chairman of today's occasion, distinguished panelists, the moderator and distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. I thank the Daily Trust organization for inviting me to participate in today's daily trust dialogue. Having listened to the co-panelists, I'm pondering as to whether I should just keep my paper aside and respond to the issues that they have raised, or whether I should stick to my paper and um, where necessary then address the issues that they have raised. I think it's only fair that I stick to my paper. And um, in this presentation, I begin with a general introduction, and then I try to look at the Nigerian context uh, and they made a very brief and short analysis of the Nigerian context before attempting to address the questions that have been posed uh, to us, which is restructuring in Nigeria, why, how, and when. I think it's important in this kind of discussion to recognize that Federalism is the principle, some would say a conceptual or institutional framework, which, divide, which defines the division of authority among national and subnational governments in a country. A country in which authority is divided between the national and subnational governments is referred to as a federation or as operating a federal system. And it is also important to recognize that regardless of whether it is the subnational governments 
which were priori independent that came together to form and create the Federation, or whether they were forced by historical circumstances into such a union, the national governments have, by legal constitutional arrangement, become the federating units, which means that they have coordinate or at least shared responsibility with the national governments. So the major objective of a federal system is to bring about non-conflictual management of diversity and to ensure sharing of power and the resources so that the country or the federation can have stable societal progress and socioeconomic development. Both in law and in practice, most federations strive and take, sure, take care to ensure equity and justice in the division of authority and resources among the federating units and in compliance with the rule of law because it is only by doing this that a conducive environment for peaceful coexistence could be nurtured, and it is the only way through which proactively irredentist tendencies can be blocked in order to facilitate societal progress and development. So technically and substantively, Nigeria is a federation and operates a federal system with states as federating unit currently. We may have had regions, but we moved into states and currently as we speak, under the current constitutional arrangement, the states are the federation unit. However, among federations that currently exist in the world, and according to the Forum of Federations, there are now about 25 federal systems in the world, but they are so diverse and complex that these 45, uh, sorry, these 25 countries actually represent about 40% of the world population. So about 25 countries representing about 40% of the world population are federations. And Nigeria is one of them, but regrettably, Nigeria among them is one of the worst models of political accommodation of diversity, as well as power and the resource sharing. And I think if we are looking for why the need for restructuring, it is important to bear this in mind. We have a federation, but compared with other federations in the world, we are not achieving or even striving seriously to achieve what the objective of a federation is, of establishing a federal system is. And that is to ensure good, effective management of diversity for peaceful coexistence in order to ensure stable socioeconomic development of citizens in such a federation. Of course, there are no perfect federations. As for that matter, there is no true federalism. Every federation is a product of the dynamics of its historical evolution and the intergroup relations. However, the better the framework or structure of the management of diversity, power, and resources in a federation, the more stable, peaceful, and socioeconomically developed would such a federation be. And this is a global experience among these 25 or so countries in the world that are federations. To develop, to have peace amidst diversity, you need to have an effective strategy and structure for the management of diversity, for political accommodation, for power sharing and the resource sharing. 
as well as the sharing of responsibilities between the national government and the subnational governments in the federating units. What accounts for the difference? What accounts for the difference between those countries that have effective management of diversity and are therefore stable and able to develop socioeconomically in their countries, and those that have poor management of diversity and therefore have challenges in their socioeconomic development are two intervening variables. The first variable, what accounts for this difference, is what is called elite consensus. They may not be perhaps seeing my face, but I'm sure they should be hearing me because all the others spoke with their masks on. Okay, I will remove it, don't worry. <laughs> all right. Um, so, so basically the point that I'm making is that for a country such as Nigeria that has poor management of diversity, that is unstable because of this poor management of diversity, that have that has an imbalance in the sharing of power and resources. Two things are important for us to be able to improve the situation and to become a more effective federation. And those are one, elite consensus, and secondly, good democratic governance. And in Nigeria, these are serious challenges and to my mind, they are the major obstacles to peace, to peaceful coexistence, to stability, and to socioeconomic development and uh, equality of opportunity uh, in our country. Therefore, for its stability, progress, and development as a modern nation state, Nigeria's current federal structure needs improvement needs refinement, indeed needs some form of what can be called restructuring. And of course, there are many reasons which uh, few Nigerians can contest as to why we got to where we are. Uh, one, of course, is that we know we have had a long history of military rule. And this long history of military rule has a culture associated with it, which is not democratic, which is generally authoritarian, and which is centrist in terms of hierarchy of authority. So in a federal system, when you have military regimes, authority is centralized. And over time, power and resources have become concentrated in the national government at the expense of the states. And unfortunately, this negative consequence of prolonged military rule has also been combined by bad and poor governance in spite of the fact that we have made a transition to democratic governance. And these are very fatal combinations for a federal system of government. You know, to have centralized authority in a federal system where resources and power are centralized, and then to have bad governance at the national level, then obviously it's a recipe for violence, for conflicts, for disagreements, and for irredentist tendencies for the dismemberment of a country. And that is what we are witnessing uh, in this country. So if we want to improve the federal system, and maybe because of the frustration with what has been happening in Nigeria, a few people probably have already reached that extremist position to say that, look, Nigeria is no longer viable. We want to opt out of Nigeria. You know? But I believe that a sober analysis would show us the best ways and the means and the strategies that can help us restructure the Federation, improve upon the management of diversity, and the power sharing and the resources so that we can have a country that we can all be proud of as citizens and so that 
our society on the basis of stability and peaceful coexistence can develop and actualize the aspirations, uh, 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 the needs and the aspirations of the Nigerian people. So um, I think I will skip the contextual analysis and only make some few references uh, to it. But I think what is clear is that when you look at the Nigerian context, not only is there that long history of military rule, but even in the 20 years of transition to democracy, we have not made much progress in terms of good governance. We unfortunately have a situation in which a group or a segment of the elite uh, has captured political power, particularly at the central level, and have commandeered resources and have proceeded to not only personalize uh, federal resources, but to also uh, mobilize ethnicity and religion in order to sustain themselves in power or to retain power. And uh, of course, not only those in government, but there are many associated interest groups that uh, uh, are nurtured by this control of resources uh, who also support that idea of mobilizing religion and ethnicity. If you are part of it, then everything is fine. If you are out of it, then you are marginalized and you want restructuring or dismemberment of the country. That is at the level of mobilization of the ordinary people. So it's very, very important that we recognize this and also factor it uh, into analysis as to what needs to be done in order to improve the situation. In the Nigerian Fourth Republic, that is since 1999, there have been two major undertakings to generate elite consensus, if not national consensus, on how to address outstanding burning national issues, including primarily the national question and the desirable structure of the Federation. For example, there was the Political Reform Conference in 2006. Many people tend to forget that uh, under the Obasanjo government. And there was also the National Conference, which has been mentioned under President Jonathan in 2014. The report of each of these uh, uh, conferences has many good and rich recommendations for addressing persistent national challenges. Regrettably, both have remained unconsidered and unimplemented particularly by the dominant uh, faction or segment of the elite that has been in governance. As governance increasingly becomes poor and bad, as Nigerian politics slides backward from democratic to undemocratic authoritarian modes of governance, and consequently, as the country is plunged into uncontrolled ethno-religious violence and other forms of criminality, the demands for restructuring have become vociferous, with even extremist irredentist demands for the dismemberment of the country. So the way things are going, Nigerians in general, and the elite in particular, need to engage with the issue of restructuring more seriously and purposefully, and begin to address it. So I say begin to address it, because again, when people discuss restructuring and want it now, we tend to forget that things have been so bad for so long that there is no way you can, within a short period of time, or with, uh, what do you call this, of hand, uh, solve the challenges. So we have to recognize that, having allowed things to be so bad for so long, we also need to have a systematic, strategic approach to how we can resolve the issue of structuring in this country so that it can be beneficial, so that it can be sustainable, and so that it can ensure enduring peace, uh, peaceful coexistence, and stability uh, in our country. But we must also recognize that restructuring alone, and I think both President uh, Jonathan and uh, 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 Chief Mwodo have made that point, restructuring alone 
cannot also solve all the problems of our country. In fact, we have to combine restructuring with reforms in governance in order to ensure that actually Nigeria becomes stable, the issue of feelings of marginalization are addressed, the issue of equality of opportunity is promoted, the issue of vandalization of resources and their diversion for personal use rather or selfish use rather than uh, 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 national or communal use uh, is addressed. These are fundamental issues. And unless, uh, uh, if, if we don't focus attention on how to combine the two and be able to do them systematically over a period of time, then obviously you can restructure, but the same problems will remain. So it's very, very important we, we bear this uh, in mind. So I think I will stop at this with the contextual analysis. I understand I have less than 10 minutes. So let me just very, very quickly, the paper I hope will be circulated and people will read it. So why are there demands for restructuring? I think one, first of all, as I said, there is heightened mobilization and politicization of ethnic, regional, religious identities by politicians generally, but also by so-called opinion leaders or community leaders that are associated with those in power. Secondly, there are indeed actual illustrations of how some people or some groups of people are marginalized or are made to feel marginalized. Whether it is in federal appointments or in uh, federal projects or in uh, inclusion or inclusiveness in governance, there are and people can easily point to evidence of marginalization. Now, of course, this evidence on balance may be marginal or minimal, but the perception of marginalization created by these incidences is more dangerous in the mobilization of ethnic and religious sentiments. And I think that is what is really happening uh, in our country. Uh, somebody uh, uh, who uh, has been a politician and uh, who career, let me call them career or professional politicians, who no longer have access in governance, you know, now become advocates of marginalization. And if, we were to be, if they were to be included tomorrow, then they will now become advocates of unity and accommodation and perseverance and so on. And we see it all the time, particularly given the way in which politicians move from one party or jump from one party uh, to another. But for the ordinary people, because they listen to what you say, then obviously once you create that feeling and perception in them, it's very, very difficult to cure it. And that is how it finds expression in ethno-religious violence and even in the other forms of criminality uh, which we now see. You know, so there are many things uh, I have listed, about six, six things that actually uh, 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 facilitate this demand for restructuring. Um, so what should restructuring entail? And now, you begin to enter into a situation in which the more you hear, the less you understand. You know, there are all sorts of notions and definitions of restructuring. For some people, like Chief uh, Adebanjo, uh, restructuring is going back to the 1960, 1966 uh, constitutional arrangement, okay? And uh, if you don't do that, you are not doing restructuring, and it is, uh, one can deduce from the position articulated, it is the only solution, this or nothing. Other people, perhaps since 1995, the uh, Constitutional uh, Conference established by late General Abacha have moved from return to, to uh, 1966. They say, okay, let's have geopolitical zones rather than the four regions, let us now have six uh, uh, regions based on the so-called geopolitical zones, uh, and then you devolve power and responsibilities and resources to those zones. And of course, more recently, uh, others 
uh, have been demanding for not a return to region or creation of new regions, but what they call the uh, 1967 to I think 1976 or 77 12 states uh, structure. They say, well, it's difficult to go back to the regions and it's also perhaps unrealistic to create new geopolitical zones and get the states to surrender their resources. Uh, and, and so let's go back to the 12 state structure. It's like meeting the other two demands halfway. Others argue that retain the existing state structure of 36 states. The only problem people speak about it is that some of the states look unviable and a lot of the challenges that these states experience is not because of the structure of the states but because of the reckless mode of governance by those who preside over these states. So retain the state structure, you know, improve good governance, but then devolve additional powers and resources from the concentrated power and the resources at the federal level to the states so that they can have more resources, they can have more responsibilities, you know, and they can become more viable and with improvement in governance and more credible people of integrity getting into politics and assuming positions at the state level, then you will have a better process and a better system. And to be honest, personally, I believe that that is what we need to do. Because I have been asking people who want a return to the four regions, or even who want the creation of uh, six geopolitical zones, how do you accommodate the relative autonomy that many people in these existing states have enjoyed and are loving into surrendering these and coming into some regional groupings. Remember that the initial objective of creation of states is to assuage the fears of minorities. You know, and that's why you created states, and then once you created 12 states, you know, uh, other new minorities and new majorities emerged in those states, and then demands for creation of other states, and that's how we now got to the such a six state structure. So, is it conceivable that you, when you create regions, that all these states can surrender their relative autonomy and now become appendages to a regional uh, 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 government? And, and I, I think it's unlikely. Because for the simple reason, look, I, I come from Kebi. And the Kebi was part of the former Northwest state which was divided into Niger and Sokoto state, which subsequently became Sokoto and Kebi state, and which presently is now Niger, Sokoto, Zamfara, and Kebi state. So even if you just want to go back to the 12 state structure, you want all these other states to surrender their relative autonomy and become subsumed under a new regional structure. You know, I'm talking about Kebi. By the time you begin to move into other areas, take the southeast, or even the southwest, where the demand for return to regions is vociferous, it's unrealistic, you know, because the same people, I, I can't imagine people in Ekiti or on those states wanting to return to the former old western region when they know that in terms of power and the resources, they will now become the new minorities. You know, so, so let us be realistic in terms of how we want to address these challenges. And by the way, maybe it's a different, I think I've taken more time than I'm allowed. So my argument is that we need to restructure, but restructuring should address imbalance of power inequities in resource distribution in the existing 13 states, I mean uh, uh, 36 states, and the best way to do it is to look at the legislative lists and deconcentrate power from the federal government which has been concentrated under military rule and spread it back to the states 
which is what federations normally do, because there are so many things under that federal legislative list, which in normal federations, unlike ours, are actually the responsibilities of the federating units. Education, health, uh, uh, well, uh, what do you call it, urban and housing, and many others like that, which have substantial resources, devolve them back to the states and give commensurate resources to the states. But of course, it means that the more resources that go to the local level, the more power at the local level becomes more attractive, the less it becomes more attractive to the central uh, power, and therefore the issues of national marginalization may be reduced. And perhaps, and I believe it will be so, the more resources, the more power are concentrated at the state levels, then the more good people uh, of integrity and who will, don't think that such resources should be allowed to be vandalized by those who capture power will become involved in local struggles to ensure good governance and to ensure effective vitalization. And now many of the states blame the federal government for challenges in education, challenges in healthcare, and so on. By the time you give that responsibilities to the states, any state that cannot take care of its schools or its own clinics, you know, has nobody else to blame. And that is why those who have children and grandchildren and so on in this state will now become more interested rather than always finding the excuse to accuse the federal government. So restructuring is possible. I believe this can be done between now and 2023 because people want something to be done. Once we begin with that, it will revive hope and confidence uh, in the process and it will catalyze a new feeling of belonging. And by the time it begins to take root in the states, I believe a lot of the challenges that we, fa we face would become uh, uh, reduced. But the key thing is you can't just do that restructuring and ignore improvement in governance. You have to combine the two. And it's possible to combine the two. And I've also discussed it in this paper. When you get it, you can see my ideas. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm coming across as a bit of a bully. Um, it's part of the job, I'm afraid. And, and I think if we have like the quick conversation we're going to have, some of the issues that haven't been totally dealt with by the various speakers can be taken as part of their response to the conversation that I want to open up. It's important to say that we have about 500 people that are part of this conversation across multiple um, social media platforms, and we will be taking questions from some of those participants. I think we can agree that um, we, Chief Mwodo and uh, uh, Chief um, Ade, sorry, and, and Chief Ade Banjo seem to both believe and agree that the 1999 Constitution is a bit illegal, and therefore any conversation around restructuring requires that it is totally done away with. I think we can agree we have a consensus that there's a need for restructuring. The why and the how is a little bit more dodgy. And so I'd like to perhaps um, go back to start with maybe Chief Mwodo. I will ask maybe one or two questions, and then we we'll open it up. And the first is, you heard uh, Professor Atahi Rujega in that last uh, statement, Chief, say that he believes um, perhaps um, we can start now by looking at the exclusive lists and devolving some of the authority of the center to the states. You've talked about the need for a national conference as a starting point and doing some sort of referendum so that people can agree about the union. Um, are you saying his way isn't going to work at all? And if so, why? I dropped the mic there. Yes. Down there, so there's nothing I can. I'm trying to get him a mic. Yeah. Oh, okay. They prefer you up here, sir, because of the camera currently. That's why I was saying you should come. Yeah. Could you sit? 
You've always wanted us here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, oh, I see. Mr. Chairman, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, um, Professor Jagas' suggestion is one way. But you know, you cannot build on quicksand. States were created in Nigeria arbitrarily, without any respect to demographic characteristics to logistic characteristics. For instance, Lagos as a town is bigger than several states in Nigeria. And the question is, if you are going to use logistic characteristics, is Lagos not more than three states in Nigeria or four states combined? There are some that have very large territorial area but no density of population. Is it reasonable to create an administrative structure for such a vast area that has very li little logistic challenges? These are not things that you can arrive at a conclusion by a priori generalization. They require a systematic study, a systematic study to understand the parameter for demarcating our existing units. Secondly, the proliferation of several states, 36 states, the recurrent expenditure of running 36 states in Nigeria is so high that it is not beneficial to creating quality life. It is better to have a few administrative structures and have better quality life. Look at Switzerland. There are so many tribes, there are so many language groups that constitute Switzerland. But authority is still devolved at a local level over fundamental things, and it works. Look at Switzerland. You know, you can see, look at the United States of America. Even for federal elections in Georgia, the election is conducted by state government officials in Georgia, and they are transparent. Look at even the concept of the right people in the right positions, like Professor Jega has said. Even though President Trump tilted the balance of the Supreme Court in the United States of America in favor of his party. The quality of people in the Supreme Court were such that they still had to say to the president in one sentence, the election was free and fair, finished. So some of the things that we expect promote good governance here are not. I went to University of Ibadu, and I was elected president of Students' Union of a Yoruba-dominated university in 1970 one year after the war. And the Yorubas are urban and cosmopolitan. I'm an Igbo man, and they still made me a president of students in favor of a Yoruba candidate. They are still Nigerians here who believe in the Nigerian culture. When I was growing up, Alaju Maru Altini was elected the mayor of Enugu Metropolis under NCNC as a political party. He married an Igbo woman. 